Hey everybody, Noah here from Learn Meta Analysis. This will be a relatively short video, but let's talk about how to actually write up the results of our meta analysis. So we ran everything in R, we got our results, but like, what does that mean? How do we present this to a reader? So within the course, you'll find a PDF of the document that I'm showing you here, but I'm just gonna walk you through uh, essentially what the conceptual idea is as we are presenting these results. So the first thing that we're going to do here is present the overall effect size and how many studies were in the analysis. So you can see that's our first sentence. We said we did a random effects meta-analysis of 27 studies, and we found the intervention was significantly more effective than the comparison conditions. We provide the overall effect size that we found here. We also mentioned heterogeneity. That's the next topic. So we're going to talk about the Q, we're going to talk about the I squared, and we're also going to mention tau squared. So from there, we want to talk about outliers and influence. So we're essentially just going to acknowledge that we checked for these, and then we're going to talk about the one study that was problematic and what we did with it. So if you recall, we had one study right here that was found to be an outlier and if you remember we didn't really know if it was an outlier or if it was influential but i am going just for the purposes of this i am going to informally say it was an outlier um, because if you look down here at the effect sizes we can see it's 2.5 whereas the others tend to be much lower um, i didn't check to see if it was influential just because this is an example so that said, we'll say it was found to be an outlier, however, it's not notably different than others in our sample, so the effect size was not removed or modified, and a forest plot is provided here, and we provide our forest plot that we created. So next, we'll talk about our moderator analysis. So we'll say we first checked to see if the grade level of the participants significantly moderated the effects of the intervention, and we found that it did not, right? And we provide that Q between value. So then we also provide our table, and this is just like what you saw uh, when we exported it as a .csv. The only thing is I added in our Q statistic as the final column. Otherwise, the only thing that I did was uh, get rid of all of the crosshatch lines and just put the one underline under the main one. Uh, I did also want to make a note that it is quite common in education at least to omit this Z value column. A lot of times this will be removed and a lot of times these uh, the lower and upper bounds of the confidence interval will instead be provided in the format that I left as a note over here with a bracket, lower bound, comma, upper bound, closed bracket, and I also made the note that this is a 95% confidence interval. All right, so finally, for a moderator analysis, we did also run that one fake moderator as a continuous variable. So if we had something like that, we could say we next checked to examine, we checked to see if it was a significant predictor of the effects of the intervention compared to comparison groups, and we found that it was not. And so again, we list that Q between value or that test, of, it's, which is the test of moderators. From there, we move to publication bias, right? So we're going to say we first checked our funnel plot for asymmetry, which is what we did, right? And so we provide our funnel plot so that readers can see it. And we said it seems slightly asymmetrical, but it didn't seem too skewed. Next, we did a trim and fill. It showed that two studies were missing on the right side of the funnel. However, imputing them did not notably change our effect size from our original effect size. So, and we provide these values of 0.68 and 0.61. And we also provide this funnel plot with the imputed studies on it. We then talk about Egger's regression. So we say we ran this and it was not significant. And just for completion sake, I did mention the failsafe N. Um, I, like I said, I, I haven't been reporting failsafe N recently because I prefer these other tests, but uh, I did include one of them here so that you could see how this write-up might look. Uh, we calculated the failsafe N and found 1028 null effect studies would be needed to make it the overall effect size not significant. So the most important thing here is essentially our conclusion. Well, I shouldn't say the most important. One of the most important things here is our conclusion to this section, right? And what does this all mean? And if you recall, I mentioned in a previous video about publication bias that I think this is more about context than it is any particular individual study. So here's what I concluded based on this data. Publication bias is not likely to be a significant concern because even though Trim and Phil found two studies were missing, it didn't change the effect size that much. And Egger's regression suggested that the funnel plot was not uh, statistically significant in terms of asymmetry. Finally, we also had that failsafe N, which indicated that many studies would be needed to notably change the significance of the overall effect size. So together, we conclude that publication bias is not likely to be a significant concern in our sample. 
So I know I went through this rather quickly, but I think this is one of those things where when you look at the PDF of the write-up, you'll be able to see how all of these different results fit into this in a nice, complete little story. Um, so thank you guys very much, and this completes our meta-analysis course on conventional meta-analysis using metaphor.